Sorry. So if you could kind of uh, uh, establish eye contact with me during the question period and, and raise your hands and stuff, I'll try to do a fair job of, of calling on people. Is that okay? Okay. And then uh, for now. Okay. So let me just give two two words of introduction here for this yeah. next session. Um, okay. So we're 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 on, on we go. Um, our first session was was a set of speakers. We all kind of coordinated in trying to think about you know, how to frame the evolutionary model. We set up the mental health model straw person as just a way of kind of contrasting, kind of showing what we were doing. Not that we had a particular, as several people have pointed out, not that we had a really great representation of all of the non-evolutionary models there by any means. So those were framing some big picture issues. These next set of speakers, now the name of this session is Proximate Evolutionary Conceptions of Adolescent Risk Behavior. So these are all people who try to get underneath the skin who study mechanism and try to think about how this happens. So we have, we have Ron Dahl, Carol Worthman, and Mark Flynn speaking, and our first speaker is Carol Worthman. That's what it says on the screen. There we go. So there we go. You're our Carol. Oh, and you, you've got the mic. Oh, yeah. You're, I, I you're all set. Yeah. You're free. Okay, yeah. great. First, um, thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, and thank you, especially to all the people I don't know. It's really exciting to be in a room with uh, not the usual suspects and, uh, and to have the kind of dialogue that all of you aim to have. Um, my goal is kind of a, a, a setup, and, and I want to emphasize that actually, um, maybe we're not supposed to confess this, but it's actually worth underscoring that we truly didn't coordinate these presentations. And so I think what you're going to find very interesting is the convergence of ideas and in some cases similar use of evidence and in other cases very different evidence to make the same kinds of points. Um, so I'm going to give you uh, a sort of a proximal view of some of the mechanisms that are really involved in um, mediating the relationships between what goes on in the ground and the constructions of people's lives um, across the life course. And of course, we're focusing um, on adolescence. And before we get started, um, I want to say a couple of things that part of the reason that I think we get so excited about this um, is that there is a lot of culture work going on here. And I'm going to show you a model in a moment why that culture work really matters. And the culture work is around, about, around genes and, um, and destiny. It's around cultural models that have to do with um, the importance of certain factors in the lives of, of people as deterministic factors. And struggles that we've had um, with um, those views of biology as necessarily pitted against um, culture, so by nature or nurture. Uh, a lot of us say it's nature and nurture by design. And I'm going to try to show you some really fabulous data that just really rub our faces in that fact. And this is partly why we get so excited, because we can just stop arguing about some of this stuff in terms of either or and understand really how things work. Um, so we've been talking about the de-demonization of genes as good genes, bad genes. And we've also then drawn out a kind of underlying moral ecology of how we think about some of these very foreign <coughs> social issues. And that's, we've already said, that's really on the table. Uh, that's really what we need to do when we're trying to do this sort of stuff. Okay, all I have to do is figure out how to make this move ahead and we'll be in front of it. <laughs> no? Sorry. Here, it'll do that. Okay. All right. So here's uh, what I'm going to talk about is just to give you a wider perspective for a moment of like why, what is the background evolutionary stuff that really um, sets up emotion as and understanding emotion as really critical, um, both in how humans operate and then if we want to understand how they operate, um, uh, something we need to study. Um, so we're going to talk about the evolution of, of the importance of affect and how that is plugged into the hard wiring of how we think and act. And I'm going to sort of start from a point that really forced uh, me to get involved in this um, based on, on data coming out of our own longitudinal study in Western North Carolina um, that has really gotten me into looking at the epigenetics literature that is going to look a lot like what Jay was talking about, but I'll take it in slightly different directions. 
um, show you a whole bunch of different kinds of evidence in terms of just how, how we think, look, and feel about and act in the world um, get shaped through gene environment in a place. So for those of you who like left, happily left biology behind a long time ago, hang on to your bio seat belts. I'll try to walk you through some of this stuff and, um, and trying to make it as user friendly as possible. Okay. Um, but before I do this, I want to give you some standard anthro stuff because um, uh, because I think this is really important for what we're talking about insofar as it may be easy to pit um, ideas against realities. And from one perspective in anthropology, which is a major enduring and uh, empirically grounded uh, set of observations, is that the two, in the case of humans, are is almost isomorphic. And here's the deal. Um, we like to think of culture as a bunch of stuff that's kind of in your head. That's beliefs, values, meanings. Um, and then when we want to get fancy about it, we get down to what it's really about, which is the organization of all those things in what we would call models or schemas. But the, the nitty gritty is that, that, that culture doesn't stay in our heads, right? It is acted upon. Um, it's acted upon in terms of first how we think and feel and what we pay attention to in the world and then how we respond to it, the kinds of intentionalities that we have and what we try to do. And those actions on the part of individuals um, cumulatively across populations and through time construct the worlds in which we live. So human ecology from that perspective is really a cultural ecology. Um, and we can't draw a distinction now between values and realities, because they are not always isomorphic, like I can have an idea, it doesn't make it true. But if I start acting on it, it has a kind of truthiness that we don't want to ignore. And then similarly, this and this is uh, very strongly grounded in ecological anthropology and then also psychological anthropology, that says that we can link this into human development, that the worlds that people create for us to live in um, are not randomly distributed. That is, um, children are assigned into certain spaces. We have ideas about how children grow up and what they need and what we want them to be and become as adults. And so the intentionalities of adults and their interpretations of what kids are doing is matched against um, cultural models of value, what's good, what's bad, um, often toward a future that, it, that may be far away or a history that is not present. So that's another thing that I want to draw forward um, that we've been talking about fast and slow in terms of future discounting. But then what are the kinds of histories and experiences that actually are embodied in many cases that are, we really need to know in order to understand why that individual is operating in the, in the way that they will. And I'll show you some really nice uh, gene environment inter interaction stuff that shows you this. Okay, so, so much for the, so much for the model. Uh, to talk about wh why, why we have social intelligence in humans, and this is a big deal because, uh, especially anthropologists, are very much exercised to understand why humans have this bizarrely large and expensive brain. Um, it, intelligence didn't evolve very often, and that kind of tells you something. Maybe there are some trade-offs here. Um, but social intelligence in humans, um, in part, is thought to be strongly pushed by the fact of our sociality. And then we already know from all kinds of uh, comparative ecology that conspecifics are our biggest competitors, right? We are, we live, breathe, we want to do a lot of the similar things. And so um, the biggest demands that we're often confronted with are the ones that are from our conspecifics. At the same time, what's really interesting with humans is these are the self-same individuals who are very often vital to us for support and resources, information, social stuff. Um, and on top of that, um, because of the um, age complex complexity and the social ecology that we live under, we're operating, even if we only are in a group of 25 or 30 people, across a pretty uh, complex historical uh, cognitive um, action space when we're dealing with the group. And so all of that stuff, when people do the numbers, is, is a big part of the argument uh, for the evolution of the large human brain and the kinds of cognition that we do. 
And one of the big things that it's been focused on is, is what people talk about in terms of niche partitioning. That is, again, part of what we're doing in this room, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation if we weren't each doing turn taking and also a certain kind of division of labor so that I have something to tell you. If you already knew what I had to say, then, you know, end of the story, right? So the big thing that humans are doing that actually expands their adaptive space, and we've talked about um, the evolution of culture, and where does the stuff for human cultural diversity come, come from? Many people would argue that it's this deep history of niche partitioning where there is a lot of drive, developmental, genetically based, um, uh, and experientially grounded for uh, this kind of niche partitioning where people actively seek out and construct um, niches in order to build their own lifestyles. And some indeed have argued that socialization is as much a part as much uh, the business of taking a bunch of people who might be rather similar and squeezing them into the kinds of available diver diversities that are out there. Okay, but the other thing, besides the niche partitioning that is a heavy load on cognition, is the demand for reciprocity and for reciprocities. And if you don't play that reciprocity game, and part of what we've been talking about here, who are the bad guys who don't do those kinds of things, and who are the good guys who, who get into all this kind of stuff, right? Um, but just imagine, again, when you came into the room, you know some people, you don't know other people. Uh, you need to sort that out quickly so that you can arrange your behavior so that you do the appropriate greeting. I don't know you, but I want to be friendly versus the, and how's your kid, and how old was that kid? You know, and you, you need to, you're bringing all this information online. That's social reciprocity that is incredibly demanding, but is a big part of how we build our cultural and social capital. Okay, so, so where does affect come into it? Why is that so important? Well, the, the big deal is that, again, if we looked around the room and you thought about the sheer amount of information that is available for you to look at, the big issue is what you're not looking at right now. What are you ignoring? This is the most vital piece of information is what do you need to pay attention to? Or the flip side is what don't you need to pay attention to? So there's an infinite potential amount of information you can pay attention to, a limited capacity of time and headspace, and a need for speed very quick, very often. And we know there's a great deal of embodied processing, that is, it depends on how you do the numbers, but a lot of people like to say that 95% of the sensory input, we know that it is a lot, <coughs> that comes into our bodies never reaches consciousness. And thank goodness, right? <laughs> So, so a, there's a lot of backgrounding stuff that is going on that in terms of like, you know, metabolism turning over, you might think that you could ignore. And I hope I'm going to show you that the kinds of affective behavioral trade-offs I'm talking about also a lot involve a lot of physiologic trade-offs that uh, feed into not just mental health risk, but also physical health risk. Uh-oh, sorry. Okay, sorry guys, this is not... Maybe I will have to use that, that thing after all. Okay, um, so emotion is fantastically useful because um, these systems draw very quickly to our attention um, the things that matter to us by integrating um, signals from the environment along with memory um, to draw our attention to what we need to pay attention to, quickly interpret it, and make some decisions about what we're going to do. And those outputs are in both um, behavioral and physiological terms. Okay, so I'm going to make a little a bit of a different argument just because that's what I do. I, I want to also link mental and physical health, which is important uh, to us, I think. Um, and cognition then, which is aided by affect, is also linked into a lot of systems that help us do resource allocation. Not just cognitive resource allocation. What am I going to pay attention to? But where do I need to spend my energy next? How am I going to direct my ongoing processes of um, heart rate regulation versus digesting my lunch versus um, preventing aging? What are going to be the trade-offs um, among those things? Uh, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And we can study this stuff because it's handily linked through a neuroendocrine continuum that I'll briefly show you about. 
Um, so I'm going to be arguing that that, that neuroendocrine continuum is a big part of um, resource allocation. Um, and this, I hope, will help us pull in a bunch of the stress literature that many of you will be familiar with that points out that um, uh, information that comes to our attention, in this case, allostatic load is handy because it's, it's really in terms of, of uh, demands on our capacity to um, adjust, and it points out that load is a mismatch between what is demanded of us and our ability to meet that demand. Um, and we have a whole system uh, that people study heavily uh, through the adrenals to um, meet those acute demands, demands um, on, on a matter of minutes, uh, minutes to half hours, let's say. But there's also another uh, system that, of neuroendocrine outflow that works rather more rapidly through direct um, innervation um, to the adrenal to dump catecholamines into your circulation. Um, and this also does immediate stuff to your system, um, as well as, um, oops, as well as um, feedback up through um, the experiences that we have. And so what we essentially have is, is a loop. That is, um, emotions are both uh, filtering what we pay attention to and, and how we uh, process those things and our physiologic responses feed back on to the emotions that we're having. In addition, there is um, another system um, the, uh, of direct innervation, the, the autonomic nervous system, that uses two, uh, two parallel systems to speed things up. If you want to think about it that way, it's very true. The sympathetic nervous system and those that kind of hold things in check, this parasympathetic. Um, and so what's driving the regulation and the relative regulation of these two things um, can also be a part of uh, the stress response. Okay. And by the way, just for those who may not be familiar, these are, all of these systems are systems that are used by people who study stress and differential responsiveness to the environment in terms of reactivity. So it could be cardiovascular reactivity, it could be cortisol, it could be catecholamines. You can tap into all these various things. But then we heard earlier that you know there's a huge literature, and particularly Bob Sapolsky was great in his who, what, why zebras don't get ulcers, of sort of distilling the vast stress literature to try to understand um, what provokes the HPA axis in particular, but then also in general, what provokes these systems. And um, for the HPA, it turns out it's particularly um, social threat that is huge. If you want to jerk the system around, just shame someone, or even give them the idea that they might be mortified any, any moment. So threat, fear, even novelty, a certain, we all know that, that novelty gets great up to a point and after that it gets scary. Um, things like disgust, shame, humiliation, social challenge, and the big ones that we've already heard about, the absence of predictability and the lack of control. And here, what's really rather touching, even for rats, the illusion of control works just as well as actual control. It's just that when you remove the illusion of control, then it gets really bad. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on with this. All right. But again, the key here is the role of appraisal. So what is uh, somebody's uh, thrill is somebody else's aversive experience. And I, I'm, uh, it shows up so badly here, but what I've got here is um, a Ferris wheel at our field site, and there are three little kids um, whom we know rather well. Um, the girl on the left is, is feigning boredom. I've like so done so many Ferris wheels. And the little boy on the right is like, he loves this. He's been, I don't know, on this, I don't know how many times. So he's going around there, and he's having a great time. And the guy in the middle is about to lose his cookies. <laughs> so three kids. Same place, different space. So that, that's one of the other things, too. And when we talk about niche partitioning, it isn't just about ghetto versus um, uh, Beverly Hills. It's um, also about being in similar spaces and carving out different niches for yourself. And in the past, we've kind of talked in terms of sort of more flabby terms of experience and temperament, tried to lay out various dimensions. Um, but I'm trying to argue that we can we can go on we can go on from that. 
and I'm going to show you now some of the, the stuff that really got me started on this. Uh, in terms of our um, longitudinal study, it's now in its 17th year, the Great Smoky Mountain Study, which is uh, Jane Costello, a developmental psychologist, who's the PI, Adrian Angle, uh, child psychiatrist. Uh, and 1,420 kids in the 11 counties of uh, Western North Carolina. Uh, with an oversample of uh, age appropriate. The, cohort, the cohorts were 9, 11, and 13 at the outset. Um, and uh, the oversample of Cherokee constitutes about a third of the sample. Um, and our initial brief, and so, so I'm part of that world, that's what pays my bills, um, is the mental health model, right? Um, nobody's been offering me a lot of money to do life history work. so. Uh, <laughs> And, and I think it's important anyway. Um, and that, the context for this is the enormous gender difference that we see in rates of depression that emerge by um, age uh, 15, whereby girls come to have double the rates of depression than do boys. Um, and we made a lot of headway uh, reproducing what uh, many people had already found that the proximate determinants of a depressive onset or an episode is bad stuff happening in your life. Um, but also that pubertal hor hormones play a role in mediating this in a gender-differentiated manner, and that actually testosterone plays a big role here. But that still left a lot of unexplained variants, and so um, this is, uh, I hope, a kind of nice example where applying a life history idea uh, coming out of the field of programming literature, which we have recently reviewed, uh, we said, well, wait a minute, you know, um, it really could be then that um, gestational constraints that are experienced in utero may set up individuals to vulnerabilities to, I use the word vulnerabilities, sensitivities, um, anyway, to um, later hardship. And this is a population where the rates of, of poverty, depending on how you define them, run at about 30%. Um, so we uh, wanted to look at uh, the relationship we knew of birth weight, uh, and we knew uh, about the histories of these kids, and what might be the relationship between birth weight and later adversities uh, that kids would experience um, in relation to depressive uh, onsets across puberty. And here, before I show you the data, I have to confess that I really hope that we might see something about guys, because uh, all our models are really explaining depression in girls we're really not doing a good job of guys. And I think it means we're asking the wrong questions in the wrong way. But here's what we found. Um, that actually the uh, low birth weight girls explain virtually 100% of the gender difference in uh, rates of depression that um, emerged over puberty. And so it's these girls, oh boy. That's when you know that the translation across platforms is not working very well. Anyway, we know that it's these girls um, that are really uh, uh, explaining that difference. Still, not that's where we're always sort of saying, well, not all, all girls go through puberty. Not all girls get depressed. Not all girls who have low birth weight get depressed. What's making the difference? And the idea was that it had, might have something to do with hardship experienced in the early life um, uh, before they hit puberty. So what I'm showing you here is a curve that we had already established, the relationship between exposure to adolescent risk factors, and uh, sorry, childhood and early adolescent risk factors. So by the time you've got three uh, such factors, this life is pretty crappy. And you can see that there's, uh, there's resilience at uh, lower levels and then it really zooms out. But as a biologist, uh, what the biologist side of me got really excited by this, that um, the low birth weight girls show a left shift in this relationships. This is a true uh, shift in, in a to a sensitization of low birth weight girls to um, adverse conditions, such that um, at, at zero exposure, they have the same virtually zero prevalence, but then um, the rates of depression go up very rapidly. And furthermore, uh, we, we just are uh, going through doing all the waves of cortisol, but looking at just the first uh, waves of cortisol, 
um, it did look as though the HPA axis um, was shifted in these kids. And what's interesting is um, the depressed kids have the kind of um, profile of responsiveness that we might have expected. Um, so there's no difference here, but it's the girls who don't get depressed um, but are low birth weight and who, uh, what this is showing is that they are unable or they do not bring down their cortisol during the course of a mild social challenge. And um, here a lot of the background work has been done uh, because you've, you've heard about Michael Meany and colleagues' work. Um, the key point here that I want to emphasize that was really thrilling to people was that you had transgenerational, faithful transgenerational transmission of a whole suite of um, behavioral and life history uh, response patterns and activities that were not genetic, that were behaviorally mediated by maternal behavior. Now there's a genetic component because the ongoing neuroendocrine um, development um, is intersecting with maternal behavior to affect um, uh, epigenetic processes, but it wasn't a matter of genetic variation driving this variation. So this is this is part of the reason for the real excitement because it's a true contextual, reliable, repeatable effect that is mediated by your social environment. Um, and so this has led a lot of people to be looking at um, uh, the systems that we can get at, and it's already been pointed out that there are going to be plenty more. Um, and certain uh, neurotransmission is a big deal because it relates to so many systems, so that could tell you everything or nothing, we could say. But we also know we're in the midst of a giant social experiment where lots of people moderate this system, right, and take um, reuptake inhibitors. And so uh, we have a lot of experience with that. But key regulators of the system are also accessible in terms of studying their genetic variation and how that relates to the kinds of stuff we're interested in. And the two that people have looked at are those that affect um, serotonin, the amount of serotonin that is in the synaptic cleft. So how much kick are you going to get out of each firing of a serotonergic neuron? Um, and then presynaptic processes that regulate um, the, the turnover of that neurotransmitter and affect them, the amount that you've got to kick with, so to speak. Um, and this is just shows you a cartoon that, that sort of lays that out and we'll walk you through all of that. But the point is, and this is really critical, look at this, I mean, we've talked about it, but again, for, for a biological anthropologist, the balance of equilibrium, and this averages across population, of the dominant allele, which is the, the long promoter region. So this appears to be um, uh, the long region is the one to which um, the genetic machinery can most readily connect and you get a lot more, at least three times as much transcript out of it. Um, whereas the short arm allele um, is much less efficient. Um, that 60%, so we've talked about their average, you know, that there are reports that there are differences across populations. We need to be in there, I'm talking to the scientists right now, we need to be in there doing really good science around this. The stuff that's been done so far, not good in terms, and maybe there's stuff I haven't seen yet, not good in terms of the sampling frames, the size of the samples, knowing more about the people that you're sampling from. Okay, so um, this is huge, right? That means you've got this, this short arm allele is present 60% prevalence in the population. This is not little stuff, um, which does suggest absolutely, without knowing anything else to anyone who knows any genetics, that something truly is going on. The same is true for the presynaptic processes that regulate certain energetic activity. Um, so that in this case, um, and you can, I've got the frequencies here, um, again, average, um, that the, the optimal, that is, uh, the more MAOA um, is produced by um, the, uh, sorry, that's a type of, is produced by the promoter region of this link. Um, which again is about 60 to 70 percent. Um, much less is like two, this is two to ten times as much MAOA is produced as by that allele. Um, so you have the same thing, a huge amount of variation that is present in the population just looking um, at 
two alleles. And we've already seen then that uh, we're just looking at single, single loci. And I haven't even talked about what happens when the two are together. And uh, we've already heard about, because partly I want to give those of you who may not be familiar with this a kind of intellectual history that will help you to understand where some of the excitement is coming from and where you can appreciate that it's still a work in progress. So Sumi's work in, uh, in the primate models was really very formative because you've already heard that what he was able to do was um, compare, uh, was to compare what we can't do with people, which is to manipulate rearing environments uh, for individuals with known genotypes. And he could demonstrate that um, heterozygous for um, the, the uh, transporter um, were more vulnerable. That is, when they're growing up with peers, which is not having a competent mom around um, is hard on a um, primate, um, that these individuals have really high reactivity. Um, to stressors. Whereas with a competent mob, these are the most competent kids. And so there's no responsiveness, you see, that they're just mellow. One could argue that isn't always a good thing, but anyway. And we've already seen these same data that people uh, have observed um, that the 5-HT transporters, um, the short arm alleles are associated with greater environmental sensitivity. Now this is really interesting because manipulations of sensitivity, I'm just going to underscore what Jay has already said, is, a, is, is interesting um, because it's, it's showing you that there are at least two life history strategies here in play. That is, those who are going to be wanting or who are attending more to what's going on in context and those who are going to be paying less attention to and again, for us scientists, but then also acting in concert with those of you who are out there in the field to really understand the conditions under which it's a good thing to ignore what's going on and a bad thing to ignore what's going on. So again, the action here that we're really paying attention to is the range. This is the sensitivity we're talking about. That is, um, how much for depressive symptomatology um, is, does it matter um, for um, growing up under conditions of really poor family function at the here and um, good family function here. Uh, same sort of thing that we've seen um, before. Um, that uh, the, and this stuff has been going on in the literature for a long time, so that's partly why we're so excited. We've phenomenologically seen that's going on in terms of heart rate variability. And, and cortisol responses and to actually be able to understand the underlying um, um, epigenetics of it is, is really very nice. Um, showing you here then, and I'm sorry the illustrations are not working, that, that the high sensitivity of the individuals with the um, uh, recessive allele uh, that are producing less NAOA um, and reproducing across environments. So this is across studies. So the, the chart on the right is a meta-analysis that, uh, that was concluding um, that across multiple studies, this is really a reliable effect, the differences in sensitivity. Um, what I would say, just to point out, that then in last summer, less is sound to me, uh, the last summer there was a meta-analysis done of literature on a, a, a serotonergic uh, transporter uh, literature, and, and there the data are not so clear. Uh, sorry. Um, what I wanted to point out to you, though, and that hasn't quite come on the table yet, uh, or only a little bit, is that um, we're talking about maltreatment as though maltreatment is maltreatment. We already know from the clinical literature that there are gender differentiated forms of maltreatment. And so what those, what those different forms are and under what conditions parents engage in those, and then how that interacts with these uh, types of phenomena, we have there's this high correlation. There's a tight correlation between the amount of testosterone that you have and your uh, lifetime aggression score. Whereas in individuals who um, are uh, have the dominant allele, um, that it goes the opposite direction. Just to 
it's very interesting and has implications for sex differences in behavior that it, these kinds of interaction effects that then start interacting with environments, gender differentiating environments that boys and girls are upper and <coughs> that's really key. And just because, I'm sorry, this is kind of crude and these are uh, new data, uh, but we've been saying, what about across other settings? And we've been doing work uh, longitudinally in Nepal uh, in an area that, uh, so both before and after the Civil War in this region over the last 10 years. And all I want to show you here is that in a different system, which is um, very looking at the genetic um, variability around the regulation of the HPA axis, where we also have a variety of the folks here, a significant action there. So here we have um, essentially a moderator of uh, glucocorticoid um, receptor activity, um, showing you that individuals who were homozygous for the recessive allele um, are the ones who when they have been partially treated in childhood, are way, more likely, are way more likely after this period of civil war to express um, um, major depression. Um, so here we're showing you that interaction between um, 10 years previously they had reported, uh, we debriefed them on their childhood histories, the trauma histories, uh, they had reported maltreatment. And this is predicting them to um, their depression score. Um, on the other hand, at the other end of the scale, um, individuals who had any of the dominant allele, homozygous or heterozygous, um, and who had not been maltreated, were much less likely to be depressed in this population. <laughs> Here's a cortisol anyway, plays out in terms of how the HPA axis is um, operating. So I've shown you that genetic variability is substantial, that gene by environment interaction is widespread, that there's conditional sensitivity to context, um, that risk the alleles of the risky conditions yield the most favorable outcomes that there's low risk, um, and that this sets up um, uh, basis for contingent like history strategy. And I'm not going to be able to go through the data, but there, there's a nice line of research as well that's really worth uh, looking at um, that stands outside of the psychology literature to some degree that also says that people can see the world of uh, social cognition in terms of the activity of um, the limbic system is different in response to social cues like faces and how you process faces. The last thing I want to leave you with is this is a rather contentious paper, but still amusing. Uh, contentious for the primatologists because they say it's more complicated than this. Um, but where they also, uh, you know, uh, because the attention to some of these alleles, again, came out of the kind of literature. And literally was people like Steve Sumi getting a load of Chinese rhesus macaques. So if you're a Chinese rhesus, you have lived in a really badass place for a monkey to live because these are people who eat you for breakfast uh, early. And so uh, they, were, they have been exported out. They live in the French and Malkas, which is a tough place to live already. Anyway, long story, most were used to them all coming from India. And suddenly there was a shipment from India, from China. And people didn't know that they had come from China. It was just like, what happened? It was racist. They're even meaner than usual. And so. Um, people started looking at uh, their variability in these loci and then going, ooh, how does that play across um, rhesus in general? Uh, because rhesus or weed species like rhesus mechanics, um, macaca mulata, are a kind of weed species like humans, you find them all over the place. Um, and what's really interesting is that um, you find that similar to humans, you have a lot of variability in these loci. Whereas the famous, the famous sweethearts is not even working well. The famous sweethearts of the primate world, especially the Barbary macaques, who are just the peace, love, and um, get along with everyone, guys, um, have virtually no characters. So what does that mean in terms of life history strategies? And um, how does life history strategies um, interact with the sort of social worlds that people set up for themselves? And that's really what we're doing. 
Um, and I'm going to leave it at this what I was just to remind ourselves yeah. of what I was saying this at the outset that this, all this isn't just in our heads, that this is all in our body. Um, and that the way that we respond to the world also drives and process information in the world, also drives the outflow of the whole series of systems that range not just from a stress response system, but through the regulation of metabolism. Um, which are, and which are all of these, as well as immune function. And we know already that um, this kind of outflow is what drives risk for chronic disease. We have a couple questions while we set up. Where, uh, um, so Ron is next. Quick question. Which, which group was it that had trouble identifying the differences in faces, or yeah. that slide went by very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Because that has some very interesting uh, implications. implications. Yeah, um, it, wa it was the, 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 the recessive allele group that is showing lower uh, amygdala as well as hippocampal activity in response to presentation faces. And another thing, the other one, the other one was showing is that there was also there's uh, uh, lower ability to discriminate between um, angry and fearful faces. So a conflation of angry and fearful faces. The problem with these studies was that they didn't really tell you much about who's really in these studies. So you don't know as much. You only need to know about the genetics. Some new great utility. Yeah, I'd be ha happy to share the reference. I just wanted to call attention to especially the low birth rate. I just wanted to call attention to especially the low birth rate data because, you know, you know, in the presentation I gave, part of it looks like malleability, susceptibility is heritable. It's it's in the genes, but I think what's going on here in the, uh, um, is that these low birth birth rate babies maybe being programmed by prenatal stress yeah. to be postnatally malleable and, and such in bad situations get depressed in good situations or at least likely to be post that. So you can have kind of prenatal programming of postnatal plasticity. So that's the way I was interpreting um, those di yeah. those low birth weight data um, that you presented and you wrote about. Yeah, in fact that, that gives me a chance to make that point again, which is that that um, it, it, the conditional is is first in utero and then and then postnatally. So it still begs the question: you may set the individual up for the possibility of certain responses, but they go in one way or another depending on. What happens now? The question I would not answer now, but is even in that instance, is how is depression potentially adaptive? Right. Mm -hmm.